Good afternoon. My name is Donna Young, and I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us to celebrate Ryerson Law's first Black History Month event, an event that I'm delighted to say is presented in partnership with our Black Law Students Association. The founding co-presidents of BALSA will be joining us later in the program. And when they do, you will see that the future of the legal profession is in very good hands. Although this is a virtual event, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which Ryerson University operates and on which many of us are working and learning today. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. It's important to acknowledge this land as it reminds us that the oppression of Indigenous peoples is not just historical. It continues in our present day, and it's imperative that we continually work towards reconciliation. I invite you to take a moment to consider how we can work both on an individual and collective level to dismantle the systems of oppression that have dispossessed Indigenous people of their lands and denied their rights to self-determination. At Ryerson Law, our mission is to reimagine legal education in pursuit of a more just society. And since we are here today to celebrate Black History Month, I think it's especially fitting for us to consider how Black and Indigenous peoples can share our stories, explore our commonalities, and work together. It's not lost on me that I'm here today to celebrate Black History Month as the Dean of Canada's newest law school, but also as the daughter of immigrants from Jamaica and Belize, and as someone who has personally experienced the sting of anti-Black racism. I think it's only fitting that we are celebrating trailblazers in Canada's legal community. Juanita Westmoreland Traore, Charles Roach, and Lincoln Alexander, who broke barriers from whom we draw inspiration, not only from their contributions to our society, but also from the strength of their character demonstrated through their humanity, humility, compassion, and resilience. It's important to acknowledge that these three are in no small measure responsible for my being here today to welcome another brilliant group of leaders who have kindly agreed to participate in this dialogue. I'm delighted that our esteemed panel of jurists, Justices Michael Tullock, Harry Laforme, Gregory Regis, and Laurieann Thomas are here to share their journeys with us and to reflect on the contributions of the trailblazers that we are celebrating today. And moderating this conversation is the incomparable Charlene Theodore, who currently serves as the president of the Ontario Bar Association, the first black individual to hold this position. Charlene is a workplace lawyer with a background in public policy and government relations and currently serves as in-house counsel to one of Ontario's largest teachers associations. Recognized as one of Canadian lawyers top 25 most influential lawyers of 2020, Charlene is known for tackling some of the most challenging issues facing the bar and the justice system, as well as bringing about positive change throughout the profession for women and people of color. Before we invite Charlene and our justices to lead this conversation, we have a short slide presentation which highlights the lives of our three honorees. And I'm really proud to say that the presentation is narrated by Jordy Smith-Jones, a member of Ryerson Law's inaugural class. Please join me in watching these highlights. This Black History Month, we honor and celebrate the lives of three distinguished trailblazers in Canada's legal community, Juanita Westmoreland Traore, Charles Roach, and Lincoln Alexander. Our first trailblazer is Juanita Westmoreland Traore. She is renowned for becoming the first black judge in Quebec's history. 
The daughter of Guyanese immigrants, Juanita was born in 1942 in Verdun, a borough of Montreal. Having lost her mother at a young age, Juanita's childhood was marked by hardship, but also by family love and support. With her father facing many employment barriers, the family was forced to move often, and as a result, Juanita attended six different elementary schools. After graduating high school and obtaining her Bachelor of Arts, Juanita studied law at the University of Montreal, graduating in 1966 as the only black student in her class. During her career, Juanita held various public sector positions, always with social justice focus. In 1995, she served as a United Nations advisor to the Commission of Truth and Justice in Haiti. In 1996, Juanita became the first black dean of a law school in Canada. During her three-year tenure as the Dean of the University of Windsor's Faculty of Law, she was appointed to the Criminal and Penal Division and the Youth Division of the Court of Quebec. This marked the first judicial appointment of a Black Canadian in Quebec's history. After serving 13 years on bench in Quebec, Juanita retired in 2012. Among her many accolades and awards, in 1991, she was notably appointed Officer of the National Order of Quebec and in 2017, Juanita received an honorary Doctors of Law degree from the Law Society of Upper Canada. In recognition of her social justice commitments and her personal journey into the field, which at the time was almost exclusively male and white. We also honor Charles Roach, who was a distinguished Canadian lawyer and human rights activist who fought for migrant rights and battled systemic racism, both on the streets and in court. Born in Belmont, Trinidad, Charles came to Canada in 1955 to study theology at the University of Saskatchewan. Influenced by Rosa Parks and the civil rights movement south of the border, Charles was compelled to change course and to study law at the University of Toronto. He was called to the bar in 1963. While working as a staff lawyer in the city of Toronto, Charles became more involved in activism, organizing and participating in marches and demonstrations and advocating for the rights of black people. In 1968, Charles started his own law practice, in which he focused on human rights issues and advocated for the poor and oppressed. While working through the courts to address these injustices, Charles engaged in advocacy to bring attention to systemic racism and oppression of black and racialized communities. With a sustained wave of shootings of unarmed black men by the police in 1970s and 1980s, Charles and other several prominent activists founded the Black Action Defense Committee, which protested the treatment of black people by police. Calling for the independent investigation of police shootings, the well-esteemed Black Action Defense Committee is credited for the creation of Ontario's Special Investigation Unit and the creation of the Commission on Systemic Racism in Ontario's criminal justice system. Charles was also an artist, poet, and musician. He owned and operated a club in the city called Little Trinidad, where Torontonians of Southern Caribbean heritage could enjoy and engage with Caribbean culture. Charles' desire to celebrate the cultural contributions of people of Caribbean descent led him and others to organize the first Caravana Parade in conjunction with the national celebration of Canada's 100th birthday in 1967. This celebration was so successful that the organizers were asked to make it an annual event. In doing so, Charles became the founding member and the first chair of the Caravana Festival, which has grown into the largest festival of its kind in North America. And finally, we pay tribute to Lincoln Alexander, the first black Canadian to serve as a member of parliament, federal cabinet minister, and lieutenant governor of Ontario. Lincoln was also a leading figure in the fight for racial equity in Canada. Lincoln was born in 1922, the oldest son of Caribbean immigrant parents. Although his father was a carpenter by trade, job opportunities were limited for black Canadians and so he worked as a porter for the Canadian Pacific Railway and his mother worked as a maid. After his parents separated, Lincoln moved to Harlem, New York as a teenager to live with his mother. Lincoln returned to Toronto in 1939, shortly after the start of the Second World War. Although he was too young to enlist, Lincoln worked as a machinist in a Hamilton-based factory making anti-aircraft guns for the war effort. Lincoln later joined the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1942, a branch of the armed forces which often restricted non-whites from entering the service. Lincoln served as a corporal with the Air Force until 1945. After the Second World War, he turned his efforts to higher education. After earning a Bachelor of Arts from McMaster University in 1949, Lincoln pursued a degree from Osgoode Hall Law School 
Lincoln entered politics in 1965 and ran as a conservative MP for Hamilton West but was defeated. Three years later, Lincoln ran again and that time he won the seat, making him the first black Canadian to sit in the House of Commons. A brilliant and distinguished public servant, Lincoln was re-elected four times, serving a total of 12 years. In 1979, Lincoln was appointed the Minister of Labour, a portfolio he held until 1980. In doing so, he became the first black Canadian to hold a cabinet position. In 1985, Lincoln Alexander was sworn in as Ontario's 24th Lieutenant Governor, the first black Canadian to be appointed a vice-regal position in Canada. As Lieutenant Governor, Lincoln was able to take an active role in multicultural affairs of Ontario, promoting the causes of racial equality, education, and youth. At the conclusion of his term, Lincoln was appointed as Chancellor of the University of Guelph in 1991, where he served an unprecedented five terms. In his provincial, federal, public, and private roles, Lincoln consistently advocated for the equal treatment of black Canadians, championing equity, diversity, and inclusion at every turn. For his contributions, Lincoln was appointed as a Companion of the Order of Canada and to the Order of Ontario in 1992. While Juanita Westmoreland Traore, Charles Roach, and Lincoln Alexander charted very different journeys in their legal career, they were all trailblazers and champions of equality and excellence in their own right. What a great tribute. Thank you so much, Dean Young, Ryerson Faculty of Law, and the Black Law Students Association for inviting me today to today's uplifting celebration of trailblazers in Canada's legal community. We are in for a treat in putting together this remarkable program. The team at Ryerson Law has assembled a panel of Black justices who are as inspiring as they are accomplished. I'm also very pleased to participate in this event because I feel a real affinity with Ryerson Law and the principles and priorities it advances. Any opportunity to connect with your forward-looking, inclusive community is one I truly relish. Now, last September, just as Canada's newest law school opened its doors, I became the first Black president in the Ontario Bar Association's 113-year history. I assumed the role in a period of social upheaval and a global reckoning on anti-Black racism. I knew that I could not take the platform and power that I was afforded in this role at a time of unrest and also possibility for granted. Change within the justice sector has not only been called for, but become more critical than ever. I feel so privileged to be a part of making that happen with the support of the diverse and dedicated OBA community of over 16,000 lawyers, judges, law students, and educators, including all of you enrolled in Ryerson's Law School. Through two initiatives launched during my presidency, Work That Works and Not Another Decade, the OBA is helping reinvent the legal workplace to be healthier, more inclusive, innovative and productive. These reimagined spaces will empower the very best work from lawyers from all walks of life. We are building a culture of unyielding equality and opportunity so that lawyers can contribute and develop their unique talents and grow into the kind of leaders that they wanna be the kind that make a difference, a meaningful difference, and light the way for others. We are leading conversations with equality champions and workplace change makers as we embark on this vision, including Ryerson's very own Assistant Dean of Student Programming and Development and Equity, Tony DeMello, on my Work That Works podcast. <clears throat> Each episode is accompanied by customized tools and resources to help listeners enact change. My episode with Tony, recorded just this week, will soon be available on Apple and Spotify. I do hope you'll give it a listen. The OBA is committed to ensuring that the workplaces you join will allow you to apply the values and fulfill the aspirations that brought you here to Ryerson in the first place. An enterprising law school that embraces and in fact demands diversity and inclusion and understands the benefit they bring to innovation and access to justice. It's so heartening to me that Ryerson's inaugural class and I have broken new ground together and begun new exciting chapters at the same time, blazing our own trails. We are able to do so thanks to those who went before us and showed us what was possible. These are vanguards and visionaries who broke barriers 
and contributed so much to the culturally diverse, compassionate, and prosperous nation we call home. They are the giants on whose shoulders we stand and whom we celebrate throughout Black History Month. They are the reason so many of us value association involvement as a means of affecting lasting change. In inclusive, welcoming, and engaged communities like Ryerson and the OBA, we find support and strength in numbers. Now, speaking of community, I'd ask all of you students and um, Ryerson faculty to save the date of February 22nd and plan to attend the first virtual OBA Blocko. It's our virtual block party that will bring Black lawyers and law students together during Black History Month in the spirit of community building and celebration. It is a free event, uh, the registration is required, and it's going to have lively conversation, camaraderie, good music, and fun in a festive supportive environment. Budding lawyers and experienced members of the bar and bench alike are all welcome to join. Keep an eye out on our social media channels for details. I do hope to see you then. Now, it is my honor to introduce the illustrious panel for today's dynamic discussion. First, the Honourable Justice Michael Tulloch is a judge on the Court of Appeal for Ontario, a position he has held since his appointment in, since in June of 2012, following nine years on the Superior Court of Justice. He'll be appearing on screen shortly. Justice Tulloch has been very actively involved in post-secondary education, as well as numerous community organizations. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Audgate Society on Legal History and sits on the Board of Directors for York University's Alumni Association. Next appearing on screen, the Honorable Justice Harry Laforme is a member of the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation located in Southern Ontario. In 1994, he was appointed a judge of the Ontario Court of Justice General Division, now the Superior Court of Justice. In 2004, Justice Laforme was appointed to the Ontario Court of Appeal. Now retired, Justice Laform is the first Indigenous person to be appointed to sit on any appellate court in the history of Canada. The Honourable Justice Gregory Regis, who will be appearing on screen, was first appointed to the Ontario Court of Justice in 1999 and then appointed Regional Senior Justice for the Central East Region in 2007. Reappointed in 2010, he completed the maximum two terms in 2013. Justice Regis is the first racialized individual to hold that position and is also the first and only St. Lucian to become a judge in Canada. He retired in 2014, but remains active in the legal community. In 2017, he served as a, as a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson University. Last but not least, the Honorable Justice Laurieann Thomas is our youngest judge, appointed to the Ontario Court of Justice in 2020. Prior to this, Justice Thomas was a sole practitioner specializing in criminal defense and a course developer and instructor at the Ryerson Law Practice Program. Justice Thomas is also a former president of the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers, where she successfully expanded the organization's role and advocated with the federal government on addressing laws which discriminate against Black Canadians. Welcome to you all, distinguished panelists. As we get underway, I'd just like to advise our audience that we will have a bit of space for your questions at the end of the program. So please submit your questions in the Q&A chat and our uh, BLSA Ryerson students will review them and bring them forward time permitting. So let's uh, do a quick journey around the table. I would love to know how Lincoln Alexander, Charles Roach, or Juanita Westman Traore, Westmoreland Traore influenced your life, either professionally or personally. Uh, Justice Tulloch, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit uh, about Lincoln Alexander's approach um, to your life? You're on mute, sir. Great, thanks, uh, Charlene, for your introduction. I also, um, want to thank Dean Young and uh, President Lashami for, as well as the law school for having this event and for uh, inviting me uh, to participate. And um, it's great to see my colleague, my former colleague, Justice Laform, uh, my former, not my former friend, still a very good friend, but former colleague and uh, my very, very good friend, um, Justice Greg Regis, as well as uh, Justice Lorianne Thomas. Welcome to the judiciary, uh, Lorianne. Um, 
I, I, I could speak about all three of these individuals because, and just to put it all in context, right? I went to law school. I started law school in 1986 and uh, at Osgoode Hall. And um, there weren't a lot of us as black students there. There were th about three of us in my class or in my year. And our first introduction to, uh, to the legal profession was uh, a host, was, was a, 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 a reception hosted uh, by Charles Roach. And um, so for him, you know, he was a great, uh, as, as we all know, he was a great um, civil rights lawyer, someone who was uh, deeply committed uh, to social justice and, uh, you know, to the betterment of the Black community. Um, while in law school, um, in, in 1987, I, I, I happened to attend a conference called the Learned, put on by the Learned Society. And uh, this was a conference um, that was held at the University of Windsor. And at that time, I met uh, uh, Professor, um, well, now judge, or former judge, uh, Westmoreland uh, Torre. And um, she was extremely influential to us as not only black students, but to all uh, students that were grappling with the issues of, of, of rights and, um, and discrimination. Um, you know, and back in the eighties, uh, those of us that were not white, we felt a real um, insidiousness of, of, of racial discrimination both directly and indirectly, um, you know, towards us. And so it was important for us to have an outlet where we can have uh, frank and open uh, conversations. And um, people like Juanita, uh, she allowed that. And um, subsequently, you know, I, I, I grew to meet uh, Lincoln Alexander. I, 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 I knew of him, I studied, all about him, um, but it wasn't until somewhere in the 90s when um, I, I and, and I met him interestingly enough in a very um, informal setting, we had seats next to each other at the Raptors game. I, at that time I had um, season's tickets and um, Mr. Alexander was a uh, member of the board of uh, directors of the Raptors organization. And, um, and, you know, because we'd see each other so much and I went up to him, I, I spoke to him. We subsequently became, you know, relatively good friends. And, 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 and um, you know, I grew to admire him and I learned firsthand about his life and the struggles that he uh, that he um, he underwent when he was in law school, and 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 I remember him telling me at that time about you know a friend of his in Hamilton that would drive him to school because he didn't have a car, you know. And um, when he started law school in the '40s, I think it, it was shortly after the World War. Um, as we all know, um, a lot of the veterans were given scholarships so they could go to law school. So he got into Osgood, and um, but he had to drive all the way from Hamilton um, to Osgood, and and you know, strangely enough, the, the young man that was driving him happens to be the father of one of my now colleagues on the Court of Appeal, Mr. Bill Horrigan, or Justice Bill Horrigan. So when Bill joined the court, both him and I. Uh, were judges um, in, in Peel together, that history immediately connected us. So it was fascinating. But these are individuals that were real to me in my own history within the legal profession. And um, these are people that I grew up looking up to and um, admiring. And, um, you know, they were a real sense of inspiration. So 
they motivated me to be the best that I could be. And, and, and so just to give you that historical context of my own involvement with all the programs. Thank you so much, Justice Tullock. Justice before, I understand that Lincoln Alexander had a huge influence on you as well. So you're on mute. Yep. Okay. I, I knew I would do it. I do it every time, actually. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Lincoln Alexander, not only for me, but for my First Nation and many other First Nations was played a really important role um, in our lives. I, I first met uh, Lincoln Alexander when, when he was the Lieutenant Governor. And I was working with indigenous, uh, an indigenous organization at the time. Um, I was a lawyer then. And uh, just because of the relationship that we constantly talk about colonialism and uh, First Nations, uh, you know, being subjected to colonialism um, we were just getting into that conversation. So part of it, because he represented the crown, um, we wanted to have a session with him so we could dialogue about what this relationship was all about. So uh, he graciously gives us an audience with him. And he, um, so this organization, which I was part of um, from a legal context, we walk in to meet the, the the uh, lieutenant governor. Uh, there's a bunch of chiefs. There's other members from council from the organization. And he was very gracious. He was very friendly. And uh, that's one of the things that we were really impressed by because he was going to listen. And we knew that he was going to listen, except that one problem came up. And that problem was really um, uh, my dad who was our chief at the time from my First Nation. And Lincoln spent a lot of time in Hamilton. And I, I really wasn't aware of all of that, but they got talking about racism and how they grew up as young men in Hamilton, where really their presence wasn't all that wanted. Mm -hmm. And they got to laughing and sharing these stories and um, they, they were talking about, and they, this was where the laughter really came from. They got talking about all these places that they got kicked out of, not because they were <laughs> rowdy or anything like that, but just because they were of color, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and once they started, they just kept going back and forth. We remember this place. Well, I remember here. We both got kicked out of this place and nobody got kicked out of this place. And it just went on and on. And so what uh, we didn't get a lot of discussion done because of my dad and Lincoln Alexander having this incredibly good time talking about when they were young men. And I think one of the very interesting things about that that it illustrates as well is that um, laughter becomes a sort of a tool to address things like, uh, you know, racism and the, the, the treatment that you can get from other people. And I noticed that Lincoln Alexander did the same thing. It was all about this whole thing came down to all these stories of abuse and, and rejection and racism. And yet they just seemed to have a really good time about talking about it. And I know that's an indigenous practice, by the way. Uh, we, we tend to take um, all of those horrible experiences, including residential school. And we can tell those stories and laugh and laugh and laugh. Um, and that seemed to be uh, the case with uh, Lincoln as well. And I, uh, I became appreciative really quickly that perhaps the black community um, handled these uh, that in misfortunes and, yeah, the yeah. same way. So that was my first experience with Lincoln and we became very close after that. And we, we too had a lot of laughs. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Something we are all relying on more and more these days. Yeah. Uh, Justice Regis, I know that Charles Roach um, holds a spe you hold a special place for Charles Roach. Can you tell us a little bit about why he means so much to you? Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ms. Theodore. Uh, I met Charles Roach when I first came to Canada in 1974. I arrived here as a 25 year old. Um, to become a student in, uh, at Ryerson to study journalism. I had been 
working as a reporter in St. Lucia, as uh, you've said before. Mm -hmm. So I was coming with a kind of sub-antenna up, if, if, you, if I can put it like that. And I heard about Charles Roach um, as this immigration lawyer in the Black, in the black community. That's, that's what I first heard of. So I naturally became involved in what was going on in the, in the Caribbean community, and I met Charlie. And I discovered very quickly that he was much more than a, an immigration lawyer. Mm -hmm. He was really a human rights lawyer. He was a champion for poor people and the underprivileged and the underdog. And uh, as I became more and more attached to what was going on in the Black community at the time, I discovered that, that Charlie, in addition to practicing law and fighting all those fights in the courts, he was actually involved in a lot of community organization. Um, you heard from the video that he was involved in the setting up Caribana. I attended a number of conferences um, at the time in Montreal and various other places from all kinds of organizations. And Charlie always seemed to be around in some way. I, I remember specifically when I got to know Bromley Armstrong, the late Bromley Armstrong, who was one of our champions for human rights. Uh, Bromley, one of the first things Bromley said to me was that he gets a lot of help from Charlie in his work. So he was all around the community doing that kind of stuff. So I think that's kind of what got me attracted to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, we, we became involved in, in, in a number of organizations. I remember one day, I think it was around 1976, somewhere around there. Uh, there was an issue involved in the police and the black community. And Charlie and Sparrow, Alan Sparrow, who was a, a city councilor at the time, and a number of people had sort of organized and said, let's go to uh, uh, th Charles Street, where the police headquarters was at the time. You know, we want, let's have a meeting with the chief. I think there was a group of about 12 of us. And this big burly policeman, you know, with his Irish accent says, you guys have to leave right away. I'm going to give you five minutes to leave. And there were a number of group of us, not me, I'm always very scared of being arrested. Um, a number of guys, <laughs> a number of these guys wanted to stand their ground, you know, and, and Charlie was the one who, who very quietly said, no guys, that's not the way to do this. There's no point in getting arrested. So he had, that kind of, of touch and mm. so you know and, and i was around and I, I i was involved in some of those issues charlie was the the chair of the martin luther king organization in toronto so he was doing that kind of work as well and uh, i i was around there with him but here's an interesting interesting thing i didn't always get along with charlie we got into fights oh, really? you know, okay. sometimes i mean when i say didn't get along we never were not friends but we didn't always agree Mm -hmm. And uh, one occasion <laughs> where we had uh, a big disagreement was in 1988. In 1988, we recall that uh, Wade Lawson was shot, uh, yes. a 17 year old uh, youth from Mississauga was shot by the police. And as uh, following this, there's a big response. And the chief of police at the time uh, invited a number of us to come and talk. Uh, so Percy Anderson, who was a professor at York University, myself, Odita Kwamina, and a bunch of us decided we'd go listen. And Charlie thought we should not go to the police station and talk to the police. We should be out on the streets marching and so on. And we got into a big disagreement about that. And I remember saying to Charlie, look, Charlie, you know, you can do the street thing. I'm going to the boardroom and try to try to make some real change. We had that kind of conversation, um, but it never disrupted the friendship really because mm -hmm. what happened after that was a week, a week later, Charlie, Charlie invited us to his home to talk about what we had discussed uh, uh, at, the, at the board of the police department and, and, and what sort of programs we were thinking of doing and how he could get involved. And that was one of the times, again, you saw the other side of Charlie. He pulled out his guitar and he started singing Calypso and just, we had a, we had a great time. So he was he was that that kind of that kind of guy. I mean, he his his work with Bad C, for example, that was a lot. He wasn't getting paid for that. He was he was taking time off his 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 law practice, and he was doing work in the community. So 
it's that kind of relationship that I had with Charlie when I went, when I decided to go to law school, he was very supportive. And, uh, you know, up to the day he died, we were good friends. I find him to be a great champion of our community. That is uh, just such a wonderful story and it mirrors the different approach, the different approaches throughout the black community that we use today uh, in, in tackling anti-black racism and how we can work together. Um, Justice Thomas, uh, please share why uh, Juanita Westmoreland Traore is so important to you. Well, I think um, unlike uh, my other panelists, uh, I was slightly less focused in my youth, so I was not involved in criminal in law or the justice system. So I don't have the privilege of knowing uh, these three trailblazers personally. Um, but for me personally, with uh, Justice Westmoreland Moreland, uh, Traore, uh, I find a connection. And, and you can look at her story, you can see that she is the only person that was the only black person in her law school. She then becomes the first black uh, professor at that said law school. Then she becomes uh, the first black dean of any Canadian law school. And then the first black judge uh, in Quebec, all these firsts, uh, trailblazer is an understatement. And then on top of it, award after award, giving back to the community. I mean, she seems destined for superhuman uh, to anyone. And so then, but then you, what kind of resonates with me or what, you know, spoke to me is really kind of how she started. So you heard in the video that she, her uh, father was, uh, her parents, uh, immer emigrated to Canada, that her mom died young. And so she's an only child raised by a only parent. Mm -hmm. And that parent struggles financially uh, to make ends meet. And yet the family comes in and she feels completely loved by her father, but also from her extended family. And that's kind of what helps her kind of get that foundation and, and likely the ability to have that confidence um, and to overcome the obstacles. Uh, Charlene and I know each other personally. And so uh, when she became the first and she's not the only person and I, I reminded her what I say to anyone who kind of breaks ceilings, which is no one breaks a glass ceiling without getting cut. And I can only imagine all that uh, her honor and, and even my co my co-panelists have gone through in being the first or the only. And so, as somebody who comes from an only parent household um, where, you know, certainly we live and struggle paycheck to paycheck, even with two jobs um, and other things that kind of where struggle kind of defined my childhood and my youth, having seeing someone like this who had a similar background just achieve so much and, and with such humility because anytime you see her speak, anytime she gets an award, it's almost like she doesn't understand why she's so respected. She Very just, humble. she just so gets it. And mm -hmm. one of the things that she does, um, and for those who haven't had a chance to go to Windsor Law School for any reason, and I've had the privilege of many times um, going to going to the Windsor Law School or or. Uh, either discuss talking with the students from there, especially the Black Law Students Association uh, from Windsor. Her presence, even though she was a dean for just a few years, it still resonates in Windsor Law School. You can still see it. They still adore her. They And there's a confidence that comes that I see in those students that comes from fe feeling valued. And that's what happens when you have someone who represents you that was in charge of your law school. It makes it, you're not the other, you're not the outsider. And that's what she did. And, it, and certainly it's so appropriate that we're doing that, this presentation. And she is one of the trailblazers being honored today at the newest Canadian law school, which and with our the new um, black dean, uh, and also some a school that focuses on equity and diversity and equality. I mean, all of that comes into play. So these three um, say so much. But for me personally, she, you know, uh, Justice West uh, Moreland Traore is just somebody who 
really is uh, inspirational, um, but inspirational way that seems some things are achievable. So I just, I, I absolutely adore her and my, my, I'm fangirling over everybody that's here. <laughs> um, but if I was ever, if I ever get the chance to meet her, it will be my complete honor. So. I, I am also fangirling over one, everyone that's here. Um, and speaking of fangirling, uh, I want to just interrupt our program for 30 seconds uh, because I got a little note while you all were speaking um, and I wanted to share it with you all. Hello, uh, Mrs. Lincoln Alexander wrote in and uh, wanted me to say hello, hello to all of you, uh, all of the justices, and wanted to uh, let me know that she is thankful to you for sharing your comments and your memories of our, of our trailblazers tonight. So I thought it was appropriate to, to uh, let you know that at this juncture. Uh, but Gregory, let's, let's, uh, let's get you off mute and let's talk again. <laughs> let's talk about, I announced very loudly and proudly um, uh, your Caribbean, specifically St. Lucian heritage, because we share the same heritage. And so I want to ask you, what do young people of Caribbean heritage need to know about Lincoln Alexander? As a first generation Canadian of Caribbean descent, what do you notice about Lincoln Alexander's impact on the legal profession that has that uniquely Caribbean imprint? Well, I think, I think it will have to be, um, what CLR James, the famous Trinidad writer, described as the Caribbean audacity. Um, when I first met, uh, I, I met him not like my two colleagues here. I never really sat down and have a personal conversation with him. We've sort of met a couple of times in a group setting. And so I've never had any personal connection with him that way. But I, I first became aware of him by watching him perform in the House of Commons as a, as a member of parliament. And when he was the minister uh, of labor in particular in the Joe, the Joe Clark government. And I remember watching the news at nights and uh, a couple of things stuck out to me. That one, he's, he was so articulate. I mean, you, you could, Lincoln could make the point and you always understood what he was saying. Mm -hmm. and, and his intellect was, was obvious. But the, the, the thing that struck me the most throughout all of this, you know, as you know, in politics, it, people banter and, and there uh, people sometimes uh, be nasty to each other. I found Lincoln was always reasonable and fair. Even when he answered his questions from the oppositions, it was always with respect, and it was always with, with a sense of duty that 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 he had to. He was doing his job. Well, of course, he was an elegant dresser, you know, which most Caribbean people can understand. You know, I mean, he, he looked like a sweet man, and and then, <laughs> the, 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 but what? What always struck out, what always sort of oozed out of, of, of him was his sense of public service. Mm -hmm. And Justice Laform has, has spoken about that already, that, 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 you know, he went on to be the lieutenant governor of, of Ontario. And I have spoken to one of my colleagues uh, uh, in Oshawa who had the, the pleasure of working uh, with him during that time while he was the lieutenant governor. And then my colleague describes him as the ultimate gentleman. Uh, they, he traveled with him, especially in, in Northern Ontario, where he dealt with some of the indigenous people that Justice Laform was talking about. And that kind of, of, of character uh, really was on display all the time. So for me, you know, he is, he is a, a true representation of, of what we can be, how black people can come uh, into a society like this, you know, that is steeped in racism and all of those and all these barriers around the place, but you can find ways to do it. I mean, Lincoln Alexander practiced law in Hamilton. And I mean, that's Hamilton at that time was by no means a multicultural society. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. there was, there was a, a, a particular group that, 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 that ruled the town and, uh, and he survived and, and the stories I've heard about him 
as a lawyer practicing in Hamilton echoes all of these qualities that, that he treated his clients with, 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 with dignity, he treated his clients with respect. And that's the kind of, of thing that we saw in the, rest, in the rest of what he did and how he served the community as a public servant. You know, all of you have made some really, you know, passionate and personal and meaningful um, observations. And I think what's important for um, the future legal leaders that are going to be graduating from Ryerson Law is, uh, first of all, just calling back to Laurieann's point, you know, there is power in being the first in a space. And Ryerson as an institution was planned and developed with this specific audience in mind was planned and developed with each of our trailblazers in mind and so not just all of the students not we're not just talking about the students in the incoming class um, but the institution in and of itself is the first it, it is it in, in and of itself is breaking ceilings and the parallels between uh the amazing work of dean young um and uh juanita westmoreland traore are are really profound um you know i think that um, I always have to speak up for labor because I'm a workplace lawyer. Uh, Lincoln Alexander's uh, impact um, and serving as the first Black Canadian as the labor minister is, is profoundly important. Um, and Hamilton is a labor town. Um, and so his work in um, integrating um, and, and kind of removing some of the racism out of the labor space, uh, not just benefits the labor bar, but it benefits us all um, as, as workers. Um, Lorian, I want to come back to you um, because you, think so, you, you said something that I think is going to resonate with everyone, especially at this time as we still continue um, to deal with the global effects of the murder of George Floyd and everything that came before it. You know, Charles Roach's advocacy was born out of a context in which unarmed Black men in Canada were being killed by police in the 1970s and the 1980s. Now, while the faith, face of activism and advocacy has changed 50 years later, the significance of Charles Roach's work, in my opinion, cannot be lost on us today. What can today's change makers, future lawyers, future leaders learn from his legacy? And how can we apply his work to our critical analysis and activism? So, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things that we can learn from his advocacy. I mean, one of the things to learn is that when he advocated, it was for the community. There was never, it was never self-serving. Um, it's so important to understand that. Uh, and you can see that in some of the advocates uh, and activists today of today, they really are fighting for you know, against anti-black racism, against discrimination of all kind, against equal for equality, and one of the ways that we can you you notice that's very different is if you compare to the 70s and 80s, we have a lot more paths to reach more people. So people are using social media. We've heard where you know where it can be used for not not great things, but there is some great good that can be used and is being used with social media, creating a, a moment. Uh, when you think of the George Floyd, you know, yes, it was on the news, but it was also in social media. It reached so many people mm -hmm. and in so many different ways. And it opened up and had discussions. And of course, there are people before George Floyd, there are people after, there are people in the States, there are people in Canada and, and definitely um, in other parts of the world. Um, but Right now, I think, is the time that you have to decide how can you change things. And so there's uh, ways, uh, certainly for the class, um, there's things that you can do in school and, and certainly work on inclusion, um, but also being engaged and putting yourself out there. So being those change makers, being part of those trailblazers, which is doing what feels uncomfortable um, doing something that you don't necessarily think you are, you know, that you it's your space, but making it your space. Uh, certainly, we've seen uh, changes, uh, discussions in the Law Society of Ontario about inclusion and diversity. Um, and so, what do we need to do? Is we need to be a part of that. And so, uh, when I was uh, with Cable and before. Uh, I, I, would, I would do more. I can't do that as much. So I'm going to have to look to this class 
to do much more of that advocacy on our behalf and for their community. But there really is ways that you can do it. And just remember when you're doing it, it's for not just, it's for your community, for everyone. And to, if you put away your ego and, and keep your, and I say that because it's really important to really listen to any opposition and address those concerns whether and see if they're valid at all. And sometimes they are something they're not, but address, you know, address the naysayers, um, but be, be focused um, and, and be involved uh, and, and do it in the way that you can, uh, whether it's um, through law, through community work, um, figure out how you can uh, be a change maker. I completely agree. Um, you know, there there is power in community, and whether that community is, community is you know, your Ryerson Law, future alumni, uh, whether that community is the OBA or Cable, um, that is where you will find not only the um, the strength and power to do that work, but where you'll find that resilience because you're not going going through it alone. Now, I'd love to chat with you, uh, Justice Laform, um, about gender. So through my own personal learning uh, and the learning of many of lawyers throughout, the organi throughout uh, my organization, we have come to understand that tr the traditional view of gender is, is, is quite different in the Indigenous community. Uh, so Justice Laform, I'd love to hear your perspective, both as a man and an Indigenous elder, on Justice Westmoreland Traore's impact and continuing role as a champion for women and racialized women in particular uh, in the judiciary and in the legal sector overall. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I, I neglected to say at the beginning, um, I wanted to thank Dean Young for the land acknowledgement. That's very important to us. And it's not just a, a rote statement of, you know, this is where Indigenous people once roamed. Um, there is significance to it. And I, I want to thank her very much. The second thing is I wanted to thank uh, everybody in the organization for inviting me to participate in this because I have such affection for Ryerson, and I really have uh, a super affection for the law school because um, I often think, God, I wish I'd have been something like that when I was going to school. And it, it, it may have been, I, I just think you're producing the right kind of graduates and those that know how to practice law instead of those machines that we went to um, in law school where, you know, it was like cookie cutter, everybody came out the same way. Um, so th the students have to appreciate what a unique experience they really are having. And I think it's going to be to the benefit of everyone, including us out here. Um, the, the f women in our, our uh, societies uh, prior to colonialism, um, had a special place, as do all people, I should say. Um, we don't have uh, elements of our society or didn't have elements of our society and people in our society who were different uh, to the extent that they were looked upon as being different. If they were looked upon at all, and this included women, um, it was that they have a special gift that they're going to provide for the community. And we have to learn how to, appreciate that gift. We have to learn to know what their gift is. It's like, um, you know, people born with mental illness or anything like that. They, they were put here for our purposes to benefit us. And we just had to learn how to listen to them and to learn what the message was. Women were the same. And in fact, women in many of our societies led our communities. They were the guiding forces in our communities. And I mean, still today, you can go to Six Nations or uh, Ganawaki or uh, any of those, especially the Haudenosaunee First Nations, they mm -hmm. still abide by their clans and the clans are led by women. They pick the people who are going to, it's sort of like the women are, are in our community are the people that pick the men for the cabinet posts. That, that's okay. sort of what it is. You don't okay. just grow up and say, oh, I'm going to lead, um, you know, interrelations or anything. You don't. The clan mother picks you and chooses you. So 
I mean, to, to be a woman in our many of our societies um, is to be somebody you had to listen to. Um, I, I just want to say something about um, the time that um, West, um, Ms. Westmoreland Priore went to law school. And I don't think this can be emphasized enough. She, she was just before my time, a couple of years into law school before me. And it was very, I found it very difficult. I, I mean, you're going into a, an alien environment. Yes. You're all by yourself. It's lonely. But to, to, to be a, a, a black woman during that time, I, I can't even imagine how courageous she was. I mean, she was alone. She, she would have, her journey by and large, I will bet you was, was a lonely one because you know, trailblazers and firsts are kind of, you have to take that with you, that loneliness because there isn't anybody there. And it's not a lot different now. I wanna tell the students out there that they have to be prepared for that as well. And Charlene, you made a very good point and that was networking and how to do that because I used to surround myself with who I was in my chambers. Um, you walked in there, you knew that was in an, um, uh, uh, the chambers of an indigenous person. Um, and that's where I took my own personal comfort from that because otherwise I was walking around with uh, people that don't understand me. Um, I came from a completely different place. I thought a completely different way. I was taught a different way. And I didn't have a lot in common with my colleagues until Michael came on board, of course. Um, but, but, but it is a lonely existence uh, and, and especially getting into this profession. And it's not a lot different today. I mean, there's more for sure, but there isn't, I mean, you walk into any law firm, you're not gonna see a wave of black faces around anyways, unless it's a black law firm, the same way you won't in, into an indigenous law firm. It's just not gonna be there. there you're still going to see a sea of white faces where, wherever you go. And that's why um, it's so important to stay connected, as you said, through places like cable and uh, your friends, the law student. You have this law student association now. Maintain those contacts because it's so important later on. It'll help you deal with the loneliness. But, um, and trust me, the, the students that are in Ryerson today um, are still going to be trailblazers. And the reason they are is because there is not that many of us out there blazing whatever trail we are. So they're still to be had. There's, these young people are still going to do that. They're still going to be firsts. And they still got different um, um, trails that they're gonna blaze because you know, we haven't arrived to the point where we lead everybody. And so I, I think they just have to appreciate that. And, but I can tell you, if, if, if Ryerson achieves what I think it will achieve, and I know it wants to achieve, um, they will be trailblazers and they'll know how to do it and they'll have the tools to do it. Very, very wise words, sir. And I, again, would encourage all of the students out there to, you know, especially during this time of isolation, uh, to rely on your networks, to rely on the support that the school is providing, um, uh, that your OBA community is providing, uh, and, and just really take care of yourselves. And because we are, we are truly here for you. We want to help you not just survive, but thrive uh, through the next uh, three years of law school. Justice Tulloch, um, question for you. So Trailblazers today, we're honoring, face both successes and failures in their journeys. I, I would love to hear how you would say failure is viewed in the legal profession and what lessons we can take from our, our failures. Um, you know, everybody, especially in law school, is kind of at the advent of their first mistake or failure. So real or perceived, what lessons can we take away from those tough moments in our journeys? So, you know, I think if we look at the lives of the people that we're honoring, um, each of them have experienced in their lives some aspect of either struggle or failures. I mean, when we, when, when, if, if you study Lincoln Alexander's life, um, you know, when he graduated from law school, he couldn't find a job anywhere in Toronto. 
And um, he ended up going back to Hamilton. And um, it was a group of racialized lawyers. I think one was a Japanese, another was a First Nations lawyer, and another a Jewish lawyer, all of whom had failed to, 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 to find jobs. And they all came together and formed their own firm. And you know, I remember him saying this was the first, like they called it the United Nations, right? So, uh, but out of that firm, they were able to still get excellent work and they were able to struggle and survive. And, and as we all know, we're now celebrating the Lincoln Alexander as someone who is a trailblazer. I mean, when he first ran for parliament, I think he also failed, uh, but eventually uh, succeeded and he became a minister of labor under um, Joe Clark's government. Um, and, and again, while he was in the house of, uh, of, of parliament, it wasn't an easy task for him. If, I mean, those of us who are students of history, I think, you know, th th there's a time that Trudeau, the father, you know, he, uh, he swore at a, um, at a member of, uh, of parliament. And, 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 and then when the reporters asked, what did you say? What he actually said was F off to the guy, but the person that he was talking to was, was, was Link Alexander. And, and, <laughs> and, um, and, and he then joked and said, he never said this. He, he said, fuddle double, right? So Link experienced failure in his time. Um, but still, by 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 struggling and overcoming uh, the obstacles, he were, were celebrating him. So failure is never final. The same can be said for um, for for Charlie Roach. Um, he could never get a job, and that's why he formed his own law firm in the '60s. And um, not only did he form a law firm, uh, you know, but his law firm was a powerhouse in the '70s for human rights and, um, and social justice. And it was a center where a lot of um, people uh, joined him in, 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 in his struggles for justice. And as Greg indicated, he had a very unique style. He felt that um, you know, for him to make the changes that he needed to make, he had to work outside of the, outside of the, the constraints of, 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 a, of a system that he felt was, was, was constraining to him. So some may see that as failure, but it really wasn't because he was still a lawyer working within the system and accomplishing you know, the ends of justice. And the same lesson can be learned from uh, uh, Justice uh, Westmoreland Torre, you know, as, as, as Harry just said, uh, when they went to school or when she went to school in the 70s, I, I can't imagine what it would have been like um, as, as a woman, but not just a woman, but a, as a black woman and as a black woman um, in Montreal. And, and, and um, that though did not in any way um, impeded her um, and or um, you know, you know, discouraged her from, 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 from pursuing her goals and trying. And another thing, right? We, we, this is a conversation of, of, of racialized lawyers and uh, an indigenous lawyer, but every one of these people that we're celebrating, they were all Canadians first. And they all saw Canada as a country where they wanted to contribute to the betterment of this country and to, to leave their mark and their impact. And um, that's one thing that I think that we can all say that they did. And so notwithstanding the fact that there are gonna be struggles, some of us are gonna fail at what we do, but you know, if we keep our, our eyes on you know, the, the, the end, goal in the end result where we want to we want to go I think that um, at the end like uh, Justice of Form says you know I'm sure that a lot of the students now will they themselves be trailblazers so if you're failing you know we're all going to fail at something but that cannot define us don't let failure define you
you know, and, and that's, you know, failure is not the end and, and, and goal. And it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not final, but, you know, our pathway is a journey. And uh, if we, you know, if we, if we struggle through it, um, we will be very successful. I couldn't agree more, Justice Tulloch. Now, that brings us almost to the end of our program, uh, but we've got a fun little lightning round in mind uh, to, uh, to close it off. Uh, like all of the students in the inaugural class of Ryerson University, Ryerson Law, um, we've had to make some, uh, we've had to make some adjustments. Um, uh, we've had to change our habits, you know? This is my actual kitchen behind me. So very, very quickly, because we have a special guest that wants to pop in. Um, what is the favorite, your favorite hobby or trend or activity that you've adopted during the pandemic? Justice Lorian Thomas, lightning round starts, go. You no, know, it's watching RuPaul. Yes. <laughs> hours and hours of RuPaul drag race. I just can't seem to get enough. So that would be it. I mean, I went for long walks, but I'd rather watch RuPaul than go for a walk. So that's it. <laughs> Justice Regis, go. Oh, I guess mine is boring. I cleaned my office after a while. I, I, all the clutter from my office is gone. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, I've, I've been reading. I've, I've reread uh, Malcolm Gladwell's David and Goliath again. I finished reading Justice McLaughlin's um, uh, biography, Truth Be Told, and I'm now starting uh, President Obama's um, biography, and I picked up the guitar again. I'm trying to play the guitar. I've been trying to play the guitar since I was 10, and I have not been able to do it. That's amazing. <laughs> Justice LaForm, what's uh, your new pandemic hobby? Well, uh, one of them is trying to learn all the various uh, mediums for uh, virtual conversations. Um, as, as you saw from the beginning, I'm not very good at it because I never know how to turn my mic mute on or off. So I'm learning that, which I'm finding kind of exciting. Um, the one thing I, 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 I really needed to say this about a comment you made about failing um, uh, or the question about failure. I, I have a son who is now in his second year of, of uh, college at Mohawk uh, College. And he's a special ed student. He has a, he requires different ways to learn um, and gets accommodated that way. But his, his definition of failure, which I've adopted is first attempt in learning. That's the acronym There's for it. first attempt, attempt in, in learning. In learning. So take that, it's worth it. Completely worth it. What a lesson. And finally, Justice Tulloch, what is your new pandemic hobby? You know what? I'm really boring. I don't think I have any new hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I miss going to the gym. So I'm working out of my house, um, you know, and, and I, I read as much as I can. But, uh, you know, I, I try to keep very, very rigid habits and, uh, so uh, I can't really say that I have, I, I have any new, new hobbies. Well, I will also keep it real since you guys were so open to our audience of uh, newly quarantined law students. I too am constantly jonesing for what next is on Netflix. And I too call my friends, including Justice Lorianne Thomas and do a detailed play-by-play -play of shows like RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> Uh, which is new for me. And you think I would not have the time, but somehow I managed to find the 25th hour in the day to call uh, my cousin who I know is watching and uh, Justice Lorianne Thomas and have detailed discussions. You would think we were talking about the latest Supreme Court decision, but nope, it's all about RuPaul. So whatever new habits you've picked up, just make sure they bring you joy, make sure they're healthy, make sure you embrace them. Again, we want you to not just survive, but thrive um, at Ryerson and, and, and you know, Dean Young and her team have built uh, an institution um, that is going to last, outlast all of us and, and be there for years to come. Um, and like I said, the institution in and of itself is a trailblazer. Uh, I am so uh, pleased to announce that we have a special guest who's going to come and join us on, on uh, our Zoom chat. Uh, Je uh, Juanita Westmoreland Traore, Justice uh, Westmoreland Traore, was listening 
um, to us uh, and, and is overwhelmed um, by all the kind and deserving things that you've said, um, that you've all said about her. And she would like to say a few words, so I will give her the floor. Okay, we just having tech help her get on live? Oh, she's not muted. <laughs> if she's muted, that's a problem. Okay, Justice Traore, you need to unmute. If we could have someone help her do that. Here we go. Just bear with us, folks. If we could have somebody who's providing IT support in the background unmute. So I cannot do that, but okay. um, Justice, it's usually in the bottom left-hand corner and it's the microphone icon. There we go. There we go. Welcome. Okay, so we're still having um, some difficulty with the sound. Uh, we will work um, in the background to try and fix that. But in the meanwhile, uh, and, and bring uh, Juanita Westmoreland Traore back. In the meanwhile, while we're working on that, um, I just want to thank you uh, to our extraordinary panelists for sharing your stories, your insights, uh, and your own calls to action. Even hearing you talk about the three incredible heroes we're here celebrating today, <clears throat> I feel so proud uh, to be in the presence of such giants in the justice sector. Uh, you are all Black leaders who continue to inspire all of everyone here in our audience and myself as well. Uh, you inspire us to lift up those who follow in our own footsteps. So at this point, I'll just check in on, let's try again, Ms. Westmoreland Traore. No, okay, so let's just, we'll, we'll try and bring you on. Uh, at this point, it is, though, my absolute pleasure to introduce Chanel Dover and Sophia Thompson, who will be bringing forward a few questions uh, from the audience, uh, time permitting. Um, Chanel and Sophia are members of Ryerson's Law Class of 2023, the inaugural class. They are also the founding co-presidents of Ryerson's Black Law Students Association. Over to you, Chanel and Sophia. Thank you so much, Charlene. I appreciate it. And thanks again to all of our esteemed panelists. Let's see if we can just do a quick question from the audience in the meantime, while we see if Justice Westmoreland Traore has got that. Yes, uh, we do have a quick question here. Good evening, Justices and everyone uh, joining us this evening. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, justices, during your law school career or during your legal career, what was one action you undertook you would say was crucial in paving the way for those who were to come after you? Maybe we can start with Justice Tullock. Okay, so I talked about um, in 1987 going to the Learned Conference. So it was out of that conference that um, a group of us um, came together and form the first racialized um, law, so like law student association, right? Um, in the law at Osgoode Hall Law School. So at that time, it was called the Nelson Mandela Law Society, and and the whole objective of that was to help, um, well, to to really advocate to the government at that time, both. Um, you know, the federal government and the Ontario government and the various um, law school presidents to divest out of South Africa to fight against um, apartheid. So, so that was our group. And, and that was a group started by 
the three of us that were young black lawyers at that time. And then subsequently, I was one of the founding members and uh, myself and a number of other, like uh, Philip Sutherland and Sandy Thomas, Patricia DeGear, Robert, Roger Rowe of, of Cable, right? So to create an organization for black lawyers, um, you know, wherein they can not only dialogue among themselves, but educate themselves. I also, one of the other things that I did was as a student, I worked with Greg Regis. Um, I was a student member of the board of, a, of the, the Jane Finch Legal Aid Clinic. And um, that was a connection for me and students from the law school to the community at Jane Finch. And at that time, Justice Regis was the director of, uh, of um, the Jane and Finch Legal Clinic. So I've been involved right from law school, right? And to try and somehow pave the way uh, so that others who follow after us uh, could have a better path. Thank you Can for I, sharing, uh, Justice Tulloch. Uh, Justice Thomas? I just want to actually add something, which actually I saw come up in the chats, and I think it's important to say because when I, um, I, I being the newest of the judges, had an option um, whether I wanted to uh, swear an oath to the Queen, and I chose not to in respect of uh, the colonization that has happened for our people. and. And the only reason why that option was given to me was because of the work of Charles Roach. And I think it's so important where here's something that he worked so hard for up until his death and it, and, and it has lasting effects and meaningful effects. And so for some, um, including my other judges who all were uh, white, uh, white judges, um, they, all, they all also made the same um, choice, which was not to uh, swear an oath to the queen. Uh, one didn't know why, uh, the rest did. And so, uh, but they wanted to follow along and they said, well, if it seems disrespectful, they, they wanted to do a, a, to kind of respect what the group was doing. But I think there is something which really um, for Ms. Roach, really defined some of his last uh, years of advocacy and look at where we are today. And it is, it's not a controversy where it was for so long and it's not a controversy that that's there. And, and I just wanna make sure um, with all the stuff that we say, cause we certainly had so much to say about what's happening, but that there really is, um, there's been some, some things that continue to permeate into past their past uh, Mr. Roach's uh, time on this earth, it, his influence uh, doesn't uh, go away. Thank you, Justice Thomas. Uh, Justice Regis? Well, I, I didn't, I had a different experience at law school. I really didn't have uh, time to do a lot of advocacy at that time because I, I was working. I throughout law school, I, I was working full time. I, I had a job at the CBC radio newsroom, so I had to go to work at midnight, I work till seven, and then go to school. You know, so my daughters were born during that period. I was busy doing those kinds of other things. So I really didn't have time to do that kind of work while I was in law school. But I, however, I was aware there were only of the three of the 400 plus students who were at, at, at law school at the time. There were only six of us uh, black students, uh, but we used to we had the time to get together to talk about issues, and other of my co my student members, my colleagues, we did some of that kind of work. But uh, the the work, as Justice Tullock pointed out, once I became a lawyer, then obviously I started working from that platform, and. Uh, and as 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 uh, we talked about earlier on, the, the law school that you're attending at Ryerson, you know, I'm an old Ryerson guy. This is my, my my the best years of my life today. Up up to today are still the three years I spent as an undergraduate at Ryerson. I love the institution. So so I'm doing that kind of work now. But when I was in law school, didn't have the time. Sorry. No worries. Thank you, Justice Regis. Uh, Justice Laform. Thank you, uh, Sophia. Um, I guess there's a, 
I'm, I'm sort of the same with, with Michael. I mean, we, I was sort of a first wave of, of indigenous students in law school. And one of the first things we did was we organized a, a, an indigenous law student association back then, and it still goes on. But one of the things that we did it for um, was to stay in touch with each other because we knew, you know, there were five of us, you know, and all across the country. So the fact that we were gonna run into each other was pretty remote. And so we decided that this association, whatever kind of funding we had or anything like that, wherever we got it from, um, we would at least try to meet a couple of times a year in a different city where one of the, the, the lawyers would be. Um, and we would just sit around. Our whole purpose was to just keep connected to each other and talk about our experiences. Um, and that's what we did. And I, I was one of the, the, two, uh, the two students at the time, indigenous students um, that put that together. I was one, the first president of that indigenous law student association. Um, the other thing I, I learned over time that I, I'd like to pass on is that I learned that you don't have to be like everybody else. In fact, you shouldn't be. In other words, don't take your experiences and the way you do things from those that are already there. I often said when people ask me, um, and this I think it applies to law as well in the practice of law, but I said, I am an indigenous judge first. I'm not a judge who is indigenous. And by that, I meant I was going to allow my life's experiences inform my decision-making. And if there's any piece of advice I would pass on, that's I think is an important one because you've got rich history and background and it needs to find its place as was suggested in the administration of law and the interpretation of law. You're, they're very valuable in that sense and don't ever forget that. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that justice reform and thank you to all of the justices. Um, and hearing all of you speak, it seems as though there is something very crucial in being the first to start something um, and set a foundation. And I think uh, Chanel and I and many other Ryerson Law students on this call can absolutely relate to that. Um, and I'm sure many of us hope to remember that teaching um, and carry it with us as we continue improving access to legal education and professional opportunities for current and prospective Black and Indigenous uh, students. Uh, with that being said, I'm just going to pass the floor over to Chanel. Thank you, Safia, and thanks again to all of the justices. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we'll get Justice with Moreland Traore to join us, so we'll continue to move forward with the program. And on behalf of the Black Law Students Association at Ryerson Law, Safia and I are pleased to announce the launch of the Balsa Black Excellence Award beginning this September 2021. The Balsa Black Excellence Award is to be awarded to a student with demonstrated social responsibility through their work in the Black community. Applicants must also have demonstrated a financial need and a high academic standing. This award is one step of many in support of our chapter's mission, vision, and values. Balsa Ryerson is committed to improving access to legal education and professional opportunities in the Black community. We aim to connect, inform, and support Black students at Ryerson Law through the powers of community, inclusivity, and opportunity. Our goal is to create a strong and resilient community for current and prospective Black students at Ryerson Law. We believe that this award represents our guiding principles that also embody and solidify Ryerson Law's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Our award's longevity depends on the support of individuals, law firms, corporations, and other donors to achieve our goal of helping Black identifying individuals attend Ryerson Law. We believe that no donation is too small to make a difference. As Chanel mentioned, uh, this is truly one of the very first major steps in support of our chapter's mission, vision, and values. Scholarships and awards are initiatives that have always been on the forefront of our minds, um, and we are very excited to be finally establishing the Balsa Black Excellence Award. Balsa Ryerson is the very first student-led association that was formally recognized at Ryerson Law, and we are now the very first association to establish an award and provide funding for incoming students in the faculty. Your support for this inaugural BALSA Award means everything to us, um, and of course, the incoming Black Law students for the September 2021 session. 
those who have come before us helped free us in extraordinary ways, and we wish to free those that come after us. Funding is one of the most crucial ways in which we can create access to legal education for Black students. Again, every single dollar helps. To contribute, we hope you will visit ryerson.ca forward slash law forward slash giving and support us on this very important initiative. When you do visit the website, you would simply, simply click donation, um, fill in the required information and under the designation tab, you will see the Balsa Black Excellence Award. I would now like to thank everyone for joining us today with a very special thank you again to our honorable justices. Before we sign off, I just wanted to quickly mention that if you enjoyed today's event, please visit ryerson.ca forward slash law for exciting upcoming events. For those of you interested in law and uh, technology, consider joining us on March 6th for Legal Next, where big ideas collide and legal futures are charted. This inaugural one day conference will offer thought provoking and divergent perspectives and will challenge us to think differently about legal education and how technology can disrupt the legal sector. Legal Next is proudly presented in partnership with Ryerson's Legal Innovation Zone and is accredited for professionalism content by the Law Society of Ontario. And the event is of course free and absolutely open to all. Finally, if you're interested in getting involved with Ryerson's Black Law Students' Association or collaborating with us on any kind of initiative, please connect with us via social media. We do have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, and our handle is the same for all platforms, which is Balsa Ryerson. So that's B-L-S-A-R-Y-E-R-S-O-N. Thank you again, and we hope to see you soon. Have a good evening, everyone.